Okay, thank you, and uh, it's the last session. Um, so when uh, Maxine and Meredith invited me uh, to uh, participate here, my understanding was that this was a reset of biodemography. It's a bit like what uh, Richard Sussman talked about. And so uh, that's the spirit in which uh, we, Brian and I, a young colleague in my department, and I put this uh, paper together. So what I'm going to speak about is uh, the social insects uh, rather than the fruit fly. I specialize in fruit flies so that I'm talking in an area that I'm not, I don't have great depth of uh, uh, knowledge here. And it's going to be essentially in some ways like a tutorial on social insects. My overall goal is to give you a sense of possibilities of the research using social insects in this uh, sort of new direction of biodemography. And I've organized this in four different parts. First, I'll give an overview of just social insects and longevity and, and so forth. And then uh, second, uh, the evolution of uh, sociality in wasps. And then thirdly, uh, a bit about the uh, honeybees, overview of honeybee biology, and, uh, and then lastly, uh, uh, some research areas that I see as possibilities here. And I see also, just to uh, set the stage too for uh, possibilities, huge possibilities, because here, I'll, uh, I'll give you a sense of the uh, diversity of species, a gradation from the pre-social to the eusocial and so forth. So there's huge possibilities for research in comparative um, biology and demography and biodemography of uh, social insects. But also there's a deep pool of uh, young uh, talent. I mean, Olaf uh, Rappel right here, Brian Johnson, for example. And these, some of the best and the brightest go into uh, research on social insects, and they're passionate about their work. So uh, there's an untapped pool there that I see as great uh, possibilities. So, uh, and there's Brian Johnson, and uh, new faculty in our department. He studied under Tom Seeley at Cornell. So uh, anyway, here's the social insects. They fall into four categories. Uh, one, the wa sorry, the ants, wasps, bees, and termites. So I have pictures there at the bottom. There are 2% uh, uh, of the 2 million uh, insect species, but it's basically 80% of all insect biomass, and they outweigh the vertebrates by sevenfold. I mean, social insects, I mean, ants, you could run outside here, and I mean, they're, let's see, what is this, uh, April? Anyway, they're, they're out there. And uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of social insects, we all, we all know that. And basically, it's uh, sophisticated problem solving that resembles voting. And so there's just really interesting questions here. How you have just uh, individuals that uh, end up building these uh, you know, termite mounds and uh, really sophisticated nests and so forth for bees and uh, ants. And they're adaptively uh, allocated to different tasks. The processes are regulated by interactions. And they're excellent models since uh, parts can, you can individually track these so that, you know, you can't get into ants uh, where you, uh, species where you have tens of thousands of species necessarily, although you can do that some. But uh, you can get, uh, you know, some of these species have uh, fairly small numbers and you can uh, bring them into the laboratory and really study these at the individual level. Okay, so sociality, just for a little uh, background here. This is basically, there's four different uh, criteria here. Continued care of young. You have cooperative brood care, so it's not just a single individual, uh, a queen or a, a, a mother. A reproductive di division of labor and any colonies with at least two adult generations, okay? Now the different levels of sociality, you have subsocial, you actually even have pre-social. Whoops, here, uh, back up. Okay, I guess I didn't, okay. Subsocial, you have colonial, you have communal, you have cooperative breeding, and then you have youth social, all right? So here's a uh, paper by Keller and a colleague uh, on, uh, that came out, what, uh, in 97, and uh, give you a perspective on the longevity of social insects relative to uh, uh, solitary insects. And so this is a mean lifespan at 87 solitary insect species. Uh, from eight orders in 61 species of eusocial insects. So you see lifespan from zero to 30 in years at the bottom, and there's a number of species there at the top. And so there it is. I mean, uh, this is actually not quite right in my view. At least maybe, it, I guess it would be for those 87 they picked. But some of these, uh, you know, non-social species can live beyond a year. But in any case, they're not going to live 25 or 30 years. And then you can see here with these uh, social species, eusocial species, whatever, it's uh, one or two years up to 30 years or so when you get into ant queens uh, that live uh, incredibly long time. So there's an overview um, I put together a number of years ago. It's more of schematic than uh, data per se, but it's insect lifespans. 
And so it goes from the most primitive on the left to the uh, most uh, advanced, at least for the insects, the hymenoptera on the left there. But anyway, you can see there, there's the isoptera, <coughs> and so this is the termites, and so that you have some of the worker termites living uh, weeks to a few months, but then you can get the queen termites that live in these huge mounds deep in the, uh, below the surface uh, subterranean that live uh, so a couple of decades or more. And then you have the hymenoptera, which is the ants, bees, and wasps. And the parasitoids, wasps, some of these just live a few weeks. This is the, I'm gonna actually walk through the evolution from that most primitive wasp all the way through ant queens uh, that live, uh, again, 20 or 30 years. So you note here that, well, I guess I, I have another uh, 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 schematic here for the, the different uh, categories to, uh, set, set of, uh, looked at alone. But anyway, the wasp, here you are, months and years. You have the bees, uh, again, months and years. But then you get the ants where it goes from weeks to decades. Same thing with termites. Uh, from weeks to decades for the queen. So you see there on the right with the uh, ones that live decades are the subterranean ones, okay? You don't find uh, 10 and 20 year uh, bees and wasps, okay? And there at the bottom you can see sort of a range of workers in terms of longevity, a uh, bit of an overlap and, uh, there, but anyway, clearly the queens are the really long lived ones, okay? And so just a summary here, you have lifespans within this group that uh, differ by 800 fold. You have differences both within and between these different groups. Males are typically short lived and the lifespan and colony size are uncorrelated. Okay, I guess I have arrows there, sorry. Okay, so look, here's, uh, I, there's a, just a classic paper that I got, I'll um, summarize here uh, in the next slide or two by a uh, famous entomologist Howard Evans back in the 50s on the evolution of um, uh, sociality in wasps. And, uh, but anyway, so I, what I do is set the stage here with uh, basically the wasp floor plan. How do you get from here to there kind of thing in the wasp? So look, wasp, I mean the uh, most primitive um, species or group of species in this, uh, in the hymenoptera are the sawflies. They're not wasps, but they're precursors to the uh, wasps. And basically they have a precision, you can see it laying an egg in a stem there. They start out with precision over position. That's the start of the sting, okay? Then you get the parasitoid with the sting, all right? Now I'm gonna talk about wasp waste um, in just a couple or three bullets here. But, uh, you know, th this is so they can manipulate their abdomen and, uh, you know, sting these caterpillars or spiders or whatever they're uh, going after. That's where this wasp waste uh, concept comes from. This is important in the bigger evolutionary picture. The ma you have mass provisioning concept, and that is where the wasp sting a prey, in this case a caterpillar, drag it back to a hole and lay an egg on it. That's as distinct from progressive provisioning like birds. They get to that uh, later on in the evolutionary sequence. And then mandibular mouth parts, you don't think, in entomology you think of sucking insects and chewing mouth parts and so forth, but in fact this is another important concept because they can use their mandibular or chewing <coughs> mouth parts that were part of the saw fly and so forth to build, uh, you know, pretty sophisticated uh, nests. Then this wasp waste uh, basically uh, restricts the nourishment to liquid. You can't get very much through that little tiny waste, and so it's liquid. And this really pre-adapts them for social evolution because, um, uh, because it's liquid, it's exchange of liquids in order to communicate, okay? So the liquid exchange for within colony evolution, basically. So there it is, that floor plan set the stage for the evolution of uh, eusociality in wasps, okay? Now, I don't, he, uh, Howard Evans had 13 different stages and I don't cover all of those here, but just to give you a flavor for sort of the progression here, you start out with these parasitoids that sting a caterpillar or whatever, and they lay an egg um, on it, or I mean, sorry, in it, and so it becomes a living incubator. But unlike that uh, wasp I, I showed you with the caterpillar before, the earliest uh, ones, they simply sting it, and then they fly away and find another and sting it. And so that you have a lot of mortality because the caterpillar, that is the incubator, is still out there to be, you know, preyed upon. And the wasp is out there sort of hanging out too, no, no uh, nest or anything. But now the next stage here would be it's a, just a really primitive nest so that the wasp would, uh, again, sting a uh, prey, drag it back maybe to a really primitive nest, and again, mass provision, just lay the egg on it. 
But now the mortality conditions change because it's not, not exposed and the mother uh, or the female can uh, hide there and hang out at night. The same thing here. This would be the next stage where again they're mass provisioning but it's a more sophisticated nest and uh, you know lay their egg on the host and seal it and, and so forth. And then this can get into where you have a single uh, uh, port uh, of entry and uh, where do we go the next? Okay, here's the next one where you have the egg, lay the egg before uh, you have any food. So this would be like a paper wasp where you lay the egg in the, um, in the cell. And then you go out and get some prey, uh, masticate, and then you regurgitate it or whatever to the developing larvae. So now you're into progressive provisioning, it's like bird feeding. Here would be another kind of variation on this, although it's the next stage where you have a single entry. And then finally, the final stage, when you get into eusociality, sociality where uh, this would be like a yellow jacket or whatnot, where it's really sophisticated nests, and again, the progressive provisioning, divisional labor, and, and so forth. So that, anyway, that's a progression. So now, here would be a sequence, again, not the, the sort of, uh, you know, grouped into broad categories here. The first one is the emergence of the, of the uh, nest as a locus. So now this is, you know, central, what they call central place foraging, where they all come back to the same place. This is really important for sociality. Uh, and so, uh, anyway, the nest concept's important. Then the emergence of parental care, that's again like the bird feeding uh, with progressive, uh, progressive feeding. And then lastly, the emergence of the queen concept. This emerges before this last stage, of course. But anyway, there's a stage in here when I was reading this early literature where uh, Evans talked about the life of the females that prolonged to overlap with the offspring. And of course, as a uh, you know, person who does aging research, this caught my attention. And really, this is uh, the threshold of sociality because you have to have a mother uh, alive at the same time her daughters are emerging. Where you have the mass provisioning in earlier stages, the mother, you know, lays the egg, seals the hole, and flies away, and probably dies before the, or, I mean, dies before the uh, offspring emerge. But here, you have the mother alive with the offspring. Now you have incipient uh, sociality, and now you're uh, off to the races, you know. So anyway, one of the carryaway messages here is that longevity was a precondition, you know, extent to longevity, a precondition for the evolution of sociality. So now that's set the stage. So what you have is extended longevity is a precondition for the evolution of incipient sociality. But sociality in turn creates conditions for the evolution of further extensions and longevity. So now you have division of labor, you have a nest, you can uh, you know, have some that guard the nest and others that go forage and so forth. And so that you just get a self, uh, uh, you get a feedback loop where, uh, you know, uh, greater longe longevity sets a stage for greater sociality and turn sets a stage for greater longevity and so forth. That's how it works. Okay. Anyway, this is another concept uh, that I'll just uh, throw out. It's one of the few original things that I actually present that I, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, contributed here uh, in the. Uh, historically anyway, but when I was um, teaching a course in insect demography way back when I first started, I asked the question, what's different about, um, what's different about social insect demography than uh, just regular, you know, uh, solitary, whatever. And of course, that's the basic linear model here is birth minus death, to, you know, times the number of the population equal to growth. And so uh, they said most of the bee people just simply, I don't know, maybe this, I think this is true. Anyway, they, um, you know, just said, call, call your individual the colony. And I just, well, that's not, that's not really very interesting. So, but anyway, the simplest model here is where you have uh, the uh, number of workers, uh, DN, uh, DT, equal the birth rate of the queen minus the death rate of the workers times the number of workers, okay? So what, uh, you know, the concept here is that the colony can't grow until the female first replaces those that die. So if it's a small colony, then most of what she produces goes into growth and there's a few to be uh, replaced. But as a colony grows, you have big numbers, the same per capita death rate, but in fact you get into big numbers where all you're doing is just replacing those that die. And so you can no longer grow unless you swarm. And so what's that maximum size? It would be simply set that to zero and you have the birth rate of the queen over the death rate of the workers equal that maximum size. So you have a demographic limit as distinct from a tree hole limit or something, which is that. 
and but also uh, the inverse of de death whoops, inverse of death rate is expectation of life. So it's simply it turns into this simple. You know why didn't I think of this? Uh, because it's so simple. The number born times the expectation of life gives you the number of uh, you know person years or b years in this case. So anyway, it's a set, there's a maximum size to uh, a colony. And by the way, I mean then told you took his used his mathematical magic to, to take this to all new levels where you have now age structure of individuals within colony, but then the age structure of colonies is really, we published this, uh, you know, one of his students took the lead anyway in ecology about three, four years ago. Okay, so there's a number just for perspective that this actually works. That the queen bee uh, lays about a thousand eggs a day and you have a 50-day worker lifespan and 50,000 sort of at the upper size of a, a honeybee colony, but at least it's ballpark. This isn't just theory, okay? So biodemographic principles, you have generation overlap is a prerequisite for the evolution of incipient sociality. This progressive provisioning ah, evolved after the evolution of extended longevity. Sociality provides the insurance-based survival advantages, so you have division of labor, and uh, among other things where in the nest and uh, that kind of infrastructure which is uh, increases survival. And then this queen uh, worker longevity differentials. This does not work so well. And so <clears throat> when the colony is small, that every worker <clears throat> retains its ability to, re their female workers, uh, to reproduce because if the queen dies, they have some chance to replace her. But when you become, you know, 20, 30,000, it's an absolute lottery. And therefore, that, at that point, or I mean somewhere along the line, you find that the workers lose their ability to reproduce and also they're shorter lived and the queen becomes the long lived individual. It's because you've gone from different levels of individualism. That is from the, you grade into the super organism as the individual rather than just the uh, parts. And so the, the queen basically becomes the ovary of that uh, superorganism. So uh, yeah, anyway, there's a picture we can include in our uh, paper there of uh, the marked ants, and uh, it, really interesting. You can see uh, how they have marked pebbles on the right there and so forth, but anyway. Okay, honeybee organization and communication. So there's a honey, we have honeybee colony organization, casts, and um, there we go, communicating, uh, and then communication to make honey, okay? Now, organization of the bee colony. You have four basic age castes. You have the newly, newly emerged, you have the nurses, you have the middle-aged bees, and you have the foragers. So this is a little tutorial on honeybee biology here. <clears throat> so what is the temporal cast? You have different ages, specialized at different castes, the physiology strongly changes to, uh, to specialize the bees for their casts, and the bees go through uh, uh, puberty. I don't know if that's used much in bee biology, but anyway, that's what uh, Brian used. Anyway, but you can see at the top, they're foraging, and at the bottom, they're uh, nurse bees, basically. Yeah, I guess I have a pointer there. And the different casts have different physiologies, so that these uh, hyperpharyngeal gland side, this is basically a protein synthesizing gland and versus the age, so you see the newly emerged, uh, very small, the uh, nurse, which is synthesizing protein to give the larvae uh, to grow and so forth, and then middle age, these are the ones that are producing honey, basically, and then the forager, they don't have to worry about that, they're out foraging. And so, you, uh, uh, you know, one of the things you can do with bees is that you can uh, manipulate the colony so that they all become nurses, so the middle age become nurse, so you can reverse aging and these sorts of things, it's a great, uh, uh, you know, opportunities for manipulating things like that, where you can make them younger and back into nurse cells, so you move, remove all the newly emerged ones, or sorry, the middle age, uh, sorry, all the nurse ones, and then the middle age have to go back to where, you know, somebody has to mind the store and the, the babies and all that business, okay? Now, newly emerged bees clean the cells. They get the dirty work like a lot of uh, the young people, right? Okay, anyway, they clean the cells, continue to develop. Then you have nurses, they feed the queen and the young. And uh, there's a developing larvae, by the way, so you can see this. This is progressive provisioning, just for perspective, if you haven't seen a beehive <coughs> like this, but those are the maggots, basically, or the larvae right there, and the bees are tending them. Then middle-aged bees are basically processing food, building the nest, and guarding the, uh, guarding the nest. And then the foragers are, of course, going out and getting nectar and pollen, okay? 
And uh, how do the casts all work together? That's a big, uh, that's, these are deep quest on uh, this material right here. Is that uh, for, well, there's a big part of the paper that Brian uh, put together, that's more, it certainly a specialty here, is where you have social insects as models. And I just talked about this earlier. You have wide variation in lifespan. You have large variation within the species. You can decouple aging and reproduction. Most species, I mean, solitary, you have a cost of reproduction. But in fact, in social insects, you have, you know, there's apparently not a cost. I mean, queen bees have somehow gotten around that, and they can lay eggs their entire, uh, their entire life. And also, one other uh, point here is this high expression of antioxidants is shown to be unnecessary for a long lifespan. Okay, I mentioned this just briefly before, how you can regulate aging through manipulation of the colony. There's several, see if I have arrows there, I go. Several physiological states <coughs> so that you can use those to study. Nurse to food <coughs> stores to foragers. Uh, <coughs> nurse to food stores to foragers. Anyway, you can manipulate that so that you can change their their role, but also their age, their aging rate. You can have nurses kept in the nurse, uh, sorry, bees kept in the nurse phase for several months, whereas foragers live only two to three weeks. There's evidence that the foragers turn off their repair pathways, and there's winter bees that live six months, and the set physiology of these bees is similar to uh, the nurses. Here's the research opportunities as uh, we uh, put together here. This is more or less my last slide here, <coughs> and that is, one, you have integration of colony, organismal, genetic, and molecular level on health and aging uh, uh, longevity. So you have from the, at the societal level, that is the superorganism level, right down to the genetic and molecular level. Huge uh, possibilities there for understanding what, when you uh, tweak mechanisms, what happens at the next uh, several levels. Uh, big possibilities there. This. Uh, flows from Ron Lee's work, Intergenerational Transfer, Health and Longevity. There's uh, certainly possibilities there. Interdisciplinary research at the individual level. This is fascinating that, uh, you know, tracking these individual, uh, individual ants in this case, but the bees or whatever, that uh, the information you get when you have it at the individual level. And then, of course, the comparative biodemography of social insects as I walk through from the uh, you know, pre-social all the way to the eusocial. And another one here is the honeybee health. You know, this colony collapse, uh, everybody's heard about this. Uh, you know, I call it like a ghost ship. They, uh, one day they they're, seem to be all there and you go back and say, where did they go? And uh, they still don't have a good handle on what's, uh, it's probably a multiple factors, it's kind of what they think it is, but this colony collapse. But anyway, there's health, there's health um, people working in honeybees that are concerned about health, just like we're concerned about human health, that would map into uh, sort of the next generation of biodemography. I think that's it. Okay, thanks very much.